Boarding schools are amongst the most influential institutions in Brittany, responsible for educating many of our politicians, judges and business leaders, even three quarters of our prime ministers. An estimated million people in the country boarded as children, but it's only now, decades on, that the true extent of sexual abuse in these schools is coming to light. I could smell the abuse, because abuse has a smell. That is a particular smell that you will only know if you've been abused. At eight years old, I was assaulted by a paedophile teacher myself. My name is Alex Renton. I'm an investigative journalist, and I'm trying to find out how much the schools knew about what was going on behind their doors. Hi there. I was very keen to talk to you about, about this character, Pilgrim. I've had people say to me, oh, come on, a little bit of fumbling around. You can't blame your problems on that. Well, that's poisonous claptrap. It's like having a, a toxin inside you, isn't it? I meet survivors speaking openly for the first time and ask what went wrong in so many of these institutions. There would have been a scandal, but it seems that in duty care, the responsible person at that school was him. Were schools really willing to disregard children's safety to protect reputations? And how did they get away with it? I think he kind of slipped justice. He got off light, you know, he got off light. It's just bloody scandalous, really. I meet the families still devastated by the impact of sexual abuse. If I could turn the clock back, I would never send him away. And most importantly, I want to know, are children in boarding schools today safe? In terms of the grooming, the school was complicit. I went away to board at the age of nine. The school was always talked about. I cried all night that first night. But the abuse I received... As a child, I did think about running away from boarding school. But then I realised... I want to cry, but Mummy said, you'll love it here. It's what one does. Boarding school. How, for centuries, Britain has educated its elite. And in 1969, I was sent off to join their ranks. Ashton House, a famous boys' prep school in Sussex, was expected to be the making of me. My parents weren't to know, would never have imagined, that in a matter of months, I would be sexually abused by my teacher. More than 40 years have passed, but I still remember the excitement of my first day at Ashton House, aged eight. In reality, I think it was the end of my childhood. The first night was terrible. I can remember being terrified in a very cold bed, trying not to cry. You lived permanently under the threat of violence. So you could be beaten for almost anything, for talking after lights out. You could be beaten for not doing very well in your Latin prep. There's a permanent low-level state of fear. It was a brutal regime under my headmaster, Billy Williamson. You had to learn to live with it, our new life. But then, there was the sexual abuse. Mr. Keane was my maths and history teacher in that first year. My memory of my sexual encounter with him is only once, and it was in the classroom where he, he usually taught. And I remember very clearly the physical feeling of being pressed up against his sort of hairy tweed jacket while he had an arm around me and his other hand was going straight down the front of my corduroy shorts. And, and I remember quite distinctly being given the, the fruit gum afterwards, which I knew already was what you got if you submitted to this. But he was a very violent man, so I'm not sure what submission meant. I don't think you could have said no. Sorry. Okay, I just compose myself a little bit. <laughs> it's funny how it's you know there were many times you tethered. Really cool. <laughs> These
schools instilled in us a rule of silence, which has kept many boarding school survivors quiet most of their lives. But in 2013, a group of my former Ashdown High schoolmates spoke up. They went to the police about a different teacher from later in the 70s, Martin Haig, who'd taught science. I realized it was time to write an article about my own experience of abuse. It opened the floodgates. I was inundated with hundreds of emails from ex-boarders, some of them women, but the vast majority men, detailing abuse at schools up and down the country. And they were very hard to read. You would be just laying across the teacher's lap and your pyjamas pulled down, and there would be some rubbing. To mark our books with one hand, whilst feeling our buttocks and testicles with the other. I told the headmaster, in so many words, because I didn't know the word, that my teacher had raped me. I never saw him again. There were so many stories of abuse, I started compiling a database of all the allegations. And it soon became obvious the story wasn't just about rogue paedophile teachers. Even more shocking were the schools themselves and how they failed to deal with allegations of abuse and in some cases allowed it to continue. Of course, Ashdown House featured heavily and several people had written to me about that science teacher, Martin Haig. In March last year, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison for indecent assault and gross indecency against four Ashdown pupils in the 70s. One of the men who gave evidence in court an ex-Ashdown pupil who was a few years below me has agreed to meet. He's asked to remain anonymous. When Mr Haig was first sexually abusive to you, how did that play out? The first time um, I, he took me to his, his room for a slippering, um, he pulled my pants down, bent me over his bed, and then nothing happened. And he was just peering very close. I felt feel his breath on me. But it was more his dormitory activity that was really, really unsettling as well. What was that? His activity normally involved the entire dormitory, and he would, um, he would, he would get everybody to, to take their pants down and get an, ere an erection quickly. And then to test the power of the erection, he would um, get us to hang things off, off the end of our, of our penises. While we were doing this, he'd be like sort of walking around, peering closely um, at, our, at our bits and pieces. How did you and... and, and the other, other boys from your year get round to going to the police. I think suddenly I became, and others, <clears throat> very conscious about the whole subject matter, because uh, it's obviously been in the news a lot, and it stirred up a lot of emotion. Um, and then there was a sort of coming together of um, quite a few um, old Ashtonians, and I think then there was, a, there, was a, you know, there was a big motivation at that stage to actually do something about it. Martin Haig said in court that two pupils did tell parents and they complained to the man who'd taken on some aspects of the running of the school, this man, Clive Williams. It was decided no further action would be taken, provided Haig left at the end of term. We've spoken to one of those two pupils who confirmed Martin Haig's story, that his parents did complain to Clive Williams, but added he'd also spoken to Clive Williams himself about Haig's abuse. That's what makes me really angry mm. now. I, I feel yeah. that I'm not so angry with my abuser, I'm angry mm. with the, the men in authority. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there'll be all sorts of excuses to this, you know, reputation of the school, and I think there would have been a scandal. But it seems that having a duty of care, the responsible person at that school was him. So the police have told me that, that Mr Keane, who abused me and, and some other boys as well, is, is dead. Mm. So we won't get a chance to face him in court. I'd like to know how that feels. What's it like? For me, um, seeing him in court, it was, it was actually my first opportunity to, to confront him properly. And although I was terrified and I was very nervous, as soon as I got onto, onto the stand, emotionally it just changed right there and then. It's just a shame we didn't do it 30 years ago. So, decades on, Haig finally faced justice. But because Ashdown allowed him to leave quietly, he simply found another teaching job here at the state-run Chaucer School in Canterbury. Now former Chaucer pupils are going to the police with yet more allegations of abuse by Haig. The school is now closed, but I decided to contact Chaucer's former headmaster, and he soon sent me an email. So 
I've been told that the Chaucer School did get a reference from Ashton House sent by the principal for Martin Haig. Blimey. That was an invitation for a school to take on board and a, a teacher who was known, known to be a serious threat to children. I, quite, I find it quite upsetting. I know from my own experience that Ashton House had hushed up allegations before, because as an eight-year-old, I told my mother what my teacher, Thomas Keane, had done to me. And she took it up with Billy Williamson, the headmaster in charge while I was there. She was persuaded to take the easier course. Calm down, this is uh, nonsense. This is, doesn't happen at a lovely place like this and, and little boys make things up. So she let it slide. To me, it's absolutely clear that uh, th th that sort of operation conducted by the school authorities placating the mother, uh, sweeping the um, complaint under the carpet was going on again and again. Seems extraordinary, but clearly avoiding scandal was more important to them than keeping children safe. We contacted the Cot Hill Trust, an organization which now owns Ashdown House. They told us these historic incidents, which occurred 25 years before the trust took over the school, are deeply shocking and are against everything we stand for. They extend heartfelt sympathy to anyone involved. My old headmaster, Billy Williamson, is dead. But Clive Williams, who later ran the school with him, told us he has the deepest sympathy for victims. But he denies in the very strongest terms that any parent or pupils made any complaint about Mr. Haig's abuse or that Mr. Haig himself admitted any abuse to him. He said he has no recollection of providing a reference and that Billy Williamson was at the school until Haig left. But was Ashdown House simply an extreme example? Just how common was this practice of disregarding accusations of abuse? And how many more children did that put at risk? As a child, I was assaulted by a paedophile teacher while at boarding school. I've spent years investigating other cases of abuse in similar institutions. Stories of shame and suffering pushed under the carpet for half a lifetime. To think we were meant to be the lucky ones. For centuries, boarding school has been the hothouse of Britain's ruling class, a fast track to power and wealth. Young hopefuls arrive with their parents and relatives to carry on with that exhausting process called education. And a place where the aspirational middle classes could buy status for their children. What's amazing is that boarding schools were run really with very little regulation. I mean, they were often private companies, and that allowed them to be run in very, often very random and very uh, bizarre ways. Prep schools catered for children from around 7 to 13, designed to feed them into Britain's top public schools like Eton and Harrow. Some ex-pupils have happy memories. Others recall years of abuse psychological and physical. All quickly learnt the system's most important lessons. Never complain, never show weakness, and never sneak. And that stiff upper lip stayed in place for decades. But then, Britain's attitude changed. Lifting the lid on years of allegations, police confirm they questioned Sir Jimmy Savile about abuse. The disgrace of Max Clifford was completed today with an eight year jail sentence. Sex abuse by the late Lib Dem MP Sir Cyril Smith say he did. Attack. The news was dominated by a succession of high profile abuse scandals. The floodgates forced open with Jimmy Savile's death in 2011. And as some of the most famous names in the worlds of television, show business, and politics were exposed, Survivors of abuse in more everyday settings realized that, at last, our stories would be taken more seriously. Top schools from up and down the country, St Paul's in London, Ampleforth College in Yorkshire, Gordonston in Scotland, have since seen their names tarnished by abuse allegations. 
Simon Bailey leads Operation Hydrant, which coordinates police investigations into historical abuse. Abuse in schools is the most prolific form of institutional abuse that officers around the country are investigating. It is almost double that of any other form of institutional abuse. And of course, within a boarding school environment, children are obviously there. They're sleeping there, they're showering there once, twice a day, every day. Further opportunities are, are afforded. We've found shocking evidence of the scale of this abuse. We made a freedom of information request to every police force in the UK. And those that responded told us, since 2012, 425 people have been accused of carrying out sexual attacks at boarding schools. Not every force could provide further details, but at least 160 people have been charged so far. And at least 171 of the total were accused of historical abuse. Just over half the forces responded, so the total figure is likely to be far higher. So while many abusive teachers are finally facing justice, the hundreds of emails I've been sent show how rarely schools reported them to police at the time. One abuse victim shared an incredible letter that his headmaster had sent to his father about his abuser. And it goes like this. He, the teacher, has done a first-class job with the choir and has taken a tremendous interest, particularly in the younger members. Unfortunately, he has placed himself in a distinctly compromising situation. For this reason, it has been my painful duty to ask him to leave. Next term, I shall merely announce that Mr. X had to leave for personal reasons. Yours sincerely. Just astonishing. It, it was almost as though this was in the manual of how to run a private boarding school. That this is how you dealt with scandal and sexual abuses. This is the system, and it's about supporting the system, not protecting children. Just blatant, blatantly arrogant and stupid. As kids, these schools failed us in so many ways, and often we've kept their secrets. It takes the average child eight years to open up about abuse. Imagine the devastation when you've done that and you aren't believed. In 1975, age 13, Philip arrived here at Luckton School in Herefordshire, a school for children aged 5 to 18. His housemaster was this man, David Panter. Things with me started very early on in my first term. Our housemaster decided, took it upon himself to uh, inspect us in the showers. I was told to bend over and he'd stick his fingers up your bum. That was to start with, to see if it was clean. And he'd use two or three fingers. It was really very painful. Could you resist? You can't. So what you, are you going to do? He would physically restrain you while he did yeah, this. Yeah, what are you going to do? But that's not where the problem is. The problem is that it starts to become normal. This is a mental rape. I think people think that paedophiles force themselves onto children. But it's a lot worse than that because they get you in the brain and they make you want them to do it. And of course, then it's, oh, well, why didn't you say anything? At what point did this start progressing? I would say a few days before the end of term, the first term, uh, the first time he, he, he started masturbating at the same time, in the shower. So he'd get in the shower. And that starts to be a bit weird. So Philip worked up the courage to tell the headmaster, Keith Vivian, what had been happening. So you describe it in your own childish way. And I remember this big hand coming down on my shoulder. Now, boy, now let's stop telling stories. Run along to your class. We don't want to cause any trouble now, do we? And that's how I used to speak. And you get washed out the door. So that is actually what happened. Panta continued working at the school. The following year, Philip moved into a dorm for older boys, away from Panther's clutches. But three years later, now a school prefect, Philip was told that Panther was still abusing the younger children. This little kid came out of Panther's study and he came out crying and he just said to me, Panther's fucked me. 
and I could smell the abuse because abuse has a smell. There's a mixture of semen and feces and urine and blood. Now, if you mix those things together, that is a particular smell that you will only know if you've been abused. So Philip went to see Keith Vivian, the same headmaster who had refused to believe him years before. I just said, I'm not packing down this time. If you don't do something about it, I'm going to tell everybody. And it was quite interesting because nothing happened for quite a while in this last year. And this carried on. And I went back again with the other um, house prefect. And he got angry with me. Vivian? Yeah, got very angry with me. Told me to go away and stop causing trouble. But the headmaster finally listened. By the next day, Panther was gone. His wife and him just disappeared quietly away. No news, no story, no police, no nothing. And that, effectively, is my story at Luxon School. But again, Panther's teaching career continued in the state sector. We tracked down the headmaster who employed him at his next school. He told us he would have received a reference from Luxon. In 2016, Panta was jailed for nine years for indecent assault and gross indecency against seven Lupton pupils. To avoid a contested trial, he was only convicted for the crimes he admitted. He pleaded not guilty to the allegations made by Philip, which he still denies, as well as the allegations Philip says were made to him by the younger boy. So Panta being jailed is not actually the end of the story. I've heard from Philip and others that the headmaster knew exactly what was going on. When does he answer for this grotesque failure to not react to, and to fail utterly to look after the safety of the children in his care? Lupton School told us our sympathies are with any survivors of non-recent abuse. However, allegations from that period cannot be answered because the school closed in 1985 and a new school was later opened under a trust which was established as a new charity, a separate legal entity. The headmaster, Keith Vivian, went on to become a vicar. He told us he has no recollection of any complaint made by Philip, but does remember when prefects came to him and says he asked Panta to leave the school premises immediately and informed the school's governing body. At no time would he not have acted immediately on such accusations but it was not a police matter at that time. Hearing these stories makes me think of my time at Ashdown House and what became of my abuser, Thomas Keane. He died in 2005. I managed to track down a copy of his death certificate. It said he was a retired teacher. I'm worried he could have gone on abusing children for decades. I do feel a responsibility. We could easily have stopped him. So we collectively put another generation of children at risk from this violent, evil man. I feel guilty about that. Of the hundreds of abuse stories that are in my database, some stand out because they echo my own experience. I've heard from a number of men complaining about a teacher called George Pilgrim, who taught here at St. Aubyn's School in East Sussex in the 1970s. So the accounts are pretty much the same. Mr. Pilgrim was one of those teachers who liked to shove his hands into boys' shorts and grope them. And it left some of them really very troubled. It's pretty much what happened to me at my school as well. I'm on my way to meet Richard, who was abused by Pilgrim a number of times. Richard has said that he doesn't want to discuss the, the details of what Pilgrim did to him on camera. And I completely empathize with that. I mean, the, it's, these are very private matters. And, and the fact that they still hurt and corrode um, all these years on is a sign of the depth of the impact. Pilgrim seemingly had no fear of getting caught. One day he was abusing 10-year-old Richard in the classroom when the headmaster, William Jervis, walked in. The headmaster was furious. 
absolutely furious. I've never seen him like that. I mean, he was a strict, severe <laughs> headmaster, but I was surprised. Um, and Pilgrim turned into a little boy himself, and he kind of walked off to his desk and cowered and made various excuses. <laughs> Uh, but it wasn't good enough. The incident was never mentioned to Richard again. There was nothing asked. There was no sort of attempt to find out mm. if anything else had happened to me or anyone else. The school had such a, a lax, feeble way of dealing with it. And the feelings of the children were not of any import? <laughs> well, apparently not, because there was nothing. What was its long-term effect? Well, I wouldn't you? recommend it as yeah. a way of developing good self-esteem. Mm. But I've had people say to me, oh, come on, a little bit of fumbling around, not so serious. You can't blame your problems on that. Well, that's poisonous claptrap. Mm. But um, it's like having a, a, a toxin inside you, isn't it? Mm. It's bound to have an effect. But as I've found before, Pilgrim simply moved on from St Albans to another private prep school. We found that school and it confirmed he'd arrived, complete with a reference from St Albans. Hi there, it's Alex Renton here. I, I was very keen to, to talk to you about, about this character Pilgrim. The headmaster from the school Pilgrim went on to teach at agreed to talk with me as long as he remained anonymous. So that's extraordinary. That's confirmation from the headmaster of the school that Pilgrim went to after St Albans, that he'd arrived there, and within two months they had to get rid of him. He was abusing the children in the classroom. Pilgrim is dead now and never faced police charges. It's the same pattern I'm seeing time and time again. Schools getting rid of the teacher, doing nothing to stop them abusing somewhere else. But for the children, entire lives can be contaminated. Decades on, we've found more evidence of abuse at St Albans. Same school, different teacher. I've been contacted by the sister of another more recent St Albans student. His story shows the damage that can be done. Gavin Purchase arrived there in 1987, aged eight. He took his own life a couple of years ago at 37 years old. His sister Rachel has kept the suicide note he left behind. Dear mum, you are probably the reason I have lasted so long and achieved so much but I am living a nightmare. Six breakdowns before the age A popular, of successful man, his letter blamed the decision to end his life on sexual abuse he said he'd been subjected to at school. We will always be with you. Love your boy, Gavin. For most of his life, Gavin hadn't spoken of his alleged abuse. It was only a few years before his death, after struggling with depression, that Gavin opened up to his family. He told them that for two years at St Albans, he'd been sexually abused by this man, his maths teacher, Geoffrey Nichols. It was under the guise of being given extra lessons and that it happened twice a week. In fact, he hadn't wanted to tell us. I think he thought he should. And then afterwards, he said he wished he hadn't said anything because he knew that all it would do is just make us all feel bad and he didn't want us to feel bad. I wish I had gone and taken him out of there. Not long after Gavin killed himself, Rachel discovered that three years after Gavin had left St Albans, Nichols was jailed for sexually abusing two other boys at the school. I then wondered, did no one really think it was odd that a teacher would take small boys to his room? Was it just something that people didn't, they really didn't, have any awareness of the kind of thing that would go on. In the final year of his life, Gavin moved back home so his mother could look after him. Hello.
Hello, Hello darling. How are you doing? Bye, Wiggly. Come on, come in, silly dog. Can you come? His room is now a collection of his most precious belongings. I always felt he was going to, to recover. I never gave up hope, not right until the very end. And um, I allowed him to be angry with me because he did feel that um, I abandoned him when I put him in boarding school. Um, but I've never abandoned him. I, I will never abandon him. It is one of the things a mother expects to do is protect her children. And, and I didn't manage to do that. The pain of Gavin's death is still raw, but just as intense as the family's anger at his alleged abuser, now long out of prison. I feel that he murdered my son, but I don't suppose he looks at it that way. If I could turn the clock back, I would never send him away. The anger uh, at what has happened is not just at myself for putting him in school, but is to put him in a school where he wasn't safe and this man could do these things to him with impunity. We contacted Geoffrey Nichols and he categorically denied Gavin's allegations. St Albans closed in 2013, but the Cothill Trust, which owns the school, told us it was under their stewardship for less than a year. But the historic allegations from the 1970s and 1990s are utterly deplorable. But these failures weren't only at school level. I've discovered this goes a lot higher to the very organisations that were meant to ensure high standards. In my research into boarding schools, I've seen many instances where schools fail to act on allegations of abuse. But among the hundreds of cases, one stood out. It was one of the country's top prep schools, and here the abuser wasn't just a lowly teacher. It was the owner and headmaster, Robin Lindsay, whose abuse spanned three decades, from the 1970s until the end of the 1990s. The school was Sherburn Prep, in Dorset. Sherburn Prep is a fascinating case, and not least because this man, dismissed as a harmless eccentric, turns out to be in a serious abuser while running that school. And for a child there, th this is the authority figure. There are no governors, no trustees. So where does a child go? Eventually, concerns over his behavior became so extreme, the Department for Education held a tribunal in 1998. Its ruling called Lindsay a fixated paedophile, and he was barred from teaching. Just months from retiring anyway, he never faced police charges. So many questions about this place. You know, how did he manage to go on running this school, looking after children for so long when so many questions were raised about him? And what was it like to be one of those children? Today, Three Sherburn Prep survivors from the 70s are meeting up for the very first time to compare memories of their old headmaster. I always remember the wash between the buttocks thing in the showers. Do you, did you have that when he used to stand there and go wash between yeah, the buttocks? Yeah, he, wa he, he washed yeah, a shower there. every day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember showers would sometimes sort of happen two, three times a day, you know, there'd be... Uh, and he would always be there. My little, littlest brother, you know, was there in the 80s where he used to feel the genitals of the rugby team at the time. He jumped into bed. I mean, he was just going crazy. If you got injured or any risk of it, he would be there rubbing embrication onto any part of your body. It was the one time when I ended up on his, uh, his own bed in his bedroom, stripped. Uh, and to this day, I've got this image of him with flaring nostrils. Uh, staring at my groin, rubbing it, uh, and I was just frozen there in, in fear. And that, that, I get that image every day. For Gilo, his worst memories are what happened to him as a 10-year-old after lights out. He'd come and stand in the middle of the dorm, mm. 
uh, for long five, what felt yeah. like five, ten minutes, to check that everybody was asleep. Yeah. You could tell that he was around at yeah. night because of the, the fug that kind of... The smell of yeah. um, the revolting tobacco. Oh, God, you, you were yeah. aware of his presence mm. and uh, the, the back rub thing would start. And I still remember very, very powerfully and distinctly when that back rub became um, him masturbating over me. I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew that I was being held down with one hand, that he told me not to turn around, and that became a pattern for the next year. Did any of you at the time attempt to tell your parents? I did try and tell my mother, and she says, oh, no, no, it can't possibly be. No, 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 no. And, that, and then that was it. She just dismissed it? Yeah, dismissed, so that wasn't, it wasn't happening. Incredibly, it was another two decades before the Independent Schools Tribunal into Sherburn Prep finally forced Lindsay out in 1998. You must feel angry on behalf of those children who came after you. I feel sad that for three decades that went unchecked. When he, he was retired or there was 700 people in this service in the Abbey mm. gave him... Um, uh, three cheers. Even today, there are people who believe that he's maligned. I think he kind of slipped justice, um, uh, really. He, he got off light, you know, he got off light. It's, it's just bloody scandalous, really. We've discovered that the opportunity to stop Lindsay first arose 14 years before the authorities acted. In 1985, a whistleblowing teacher from Sherburn Prep went to IAPS the Association of Prep Schools. A school's membership of this umbrella group was meant to be a guarantee of high standards. They investigated and said he'd behaved foolishly and indiscreetly, but according to the later tribunal ruling, did not take strong or effective action against him. It seems shockingly complacent, so I took a closer look at who sat on the IAPS board back then, and I realized two of the headmasters on there were already known to me, including its chairman, Robin Peverett. They were absolutely the wrong men to be looking into abuse at a prep school. There's Robin Peverett, later convicted of sexually abusing his own pupils, and there's Robin Lindsay himself. It's extraordinary. Despite the serious allegations against him, Lindsay remained on the IAPS board for another two years. And it was another eight years before inspectors again visited the school, this time from Dorset Social Services. Our Freedom of Information request revealed a report with a catalogue of paedophilic behaviour. Children complaining of Lindsay's supervised showers, his interest in watching their naked bodies, close hugs with the stench of cigar smoke. Most incredibly was the account of one boy who claimed he was sexually molested by an intruder wearing a wig and stinking of cigars. The headmaster told him it must have been a dream. Robin Lindsay died in 2016. We've managed to track down one of the few people who can explain why he never faced police charges. Jill Donnell was the chief superintendent at Dorset Police and she oversaw the investigation into him in 1993. I remembered this case over the many, many cases, over the many, many years I've worked in the police, for the challenges that we had getting the evidence that's necessary. And in the case that we're talking about, the main place that evidence is going to come from is from small children. And what was the reaction of the parents when you went to try and talk to these children? I'm sad to say that the majority that I spoke to were uh, very hesitant and some, some of them very, very clear they were not going to let us talk to the children. And it was said to me on more than one occasion that the most important thing for the parents was that their children went to the required public school and that anything that was done to uh, endanger that, they weren't terribly supportive of at all. So their careers, their academic careers were more important yes. than their safety? Yes, their priority was about their the future of their children and not was what may or may not have been happening to them at that time. Sherburn Preparatory School told us they have sympathy for any victims, 
and said it takes the welfare of current and former pupils very seriously. But as they bought the school from Lindsay in 1998, it is now an entirely different legal, financial and governance entity. It is therefore unable to comment on any of the issues raised. On their failure to take effective action against Lindsay, IAPS, the independent association of prep schools, simply told us they are appalled by the events of the past. Today, the education, care and welfare of young people is their primary concern, and they demand the most exacting standards of themselves and their schools. As a journalist and as a survivor, I know the lifelong damage abuse can cause. But as an adult, I've never looked an offender in the eyes and asked them why. Today, I'm on my way to meet James, a former prep school teacher and a paedophile. The teacher who sexually assaulted me is dead, so now I'm, I'm never going to get the chance to ask the questions I want to ask. But there are questions, there are universal questions I need to ask for me and, and for the thousands of people like me who, who were abused. James has served time in prison for sexual assaults on children in the 70s and 80s. His views are shocking, but shed light on the culture that allowed sexual abuse to become almost accepted. I was sexually abused by not one master, but by five when I was at prep school. It didn't, it never done me any harm. They made my life so much more pleasant in various ways that I accepted it. I was getting something from them that I wasn't getting from my parents. Uh, dinky toys, cigarette cards, whole sets, and the love and affection which I was deprived of at home. When, when you got the job, uh, with background checks done on you? None whatsoever, no. And that was normal at the time? Yes, yeah. And when you arrived there, um, were you aware that there was unorthodox relationships between the teachers and the boys? At least two of my predecessors had been dismissed for um, intimacy with the boys, shall we say. And then after about the first year, um, I learned that the deputy headmaster uh, was also intimately involved with a number of boys. And, and when you say in intimate relationship, it, what does that mean? It, it's a, a simple case of a master literally falling in love with an attractive boy. I find this very hard to hear, and I'm particularly horrified to discover he believes his first victim had actually wanted to be abused. It was the boy that instigated the actual um, intimacy. Um, he approached me one day and um, suggested that I did something to him. Simple as that. And that's not unusual. That was to perform a, a sexual act? Yes. Yeah. The initial boy we, we, we've been speaking about was uh, 10 years old, 11 years old, I think? He was, uh, well, he was nearly 12. He was nearly 12. Yeah. Um, do you feel he gave consent? Yes. H how, how can one know that with, with someone that age? <laughs> Good question. A 12-year-old boy is just as capable of giving consent as any other age. For a survivor like me, it's upsetting to hear a paedophile convince himself that his victim can be complicit. It is one of the cruelest and most damaging aspects of abuse. Do you think what you've described is still going on in boarding schools today? My guess is that yes, it is, because it is traditional. I know you won't like that word, but it is traditional. It has been going on for generations. Our evidence suggests it would be naive to believe boarding schools no longer hold appeal for predatory paedophiles. Our freedom of information request to every police force revealed that since 2012, at least 125 people have been accused by children of recent sex attacks at boarding schools. And there are at least 31 ongoing investigations. So it's vital schools today take their duty to protect children seriously. 
But many say there's still confusion over what schools must do if they suspect abuse. The government tells schools they should report abuse allegations to their local authority. So we also made an FOI request to every local authority in England and Wales and found that since 2012, 404 allegations of sexual abuse were reported by boarding schools. But there were glaring differences in reporting figures. One council responsible for 19 boarding schools had received 60 complaints. Another, with 20, just two. Perhaps that's down to one startling fact, that schools in the UK are still not legally obliged to tell the authorities. Caldercote School in Buckinghamshire saw several of its former teachers convicted for abuse in the 1970s. Tom Perry was the first complainant in the scandal and now campaigns for the reporting of abuse to be made legally mandatory. Do you think things are genuinely different at the boarding schools nowadays? Um, I don't see how they can be. Um, in simple terms, when I was abused and when you were abused, uh, there was no requirement to report abuse. Today, there is no requirement to report abuse. If you can spot a difference in there somewhere, let me know. But the current rules, the statutory guidance, say you should report suspicion yes. of a known or sus suspected abuse. Is that not enough? <laughs> yeah, but look, I should lose weight. I should drink less. But there's no one to hold me to account for it. And it's exactly the same in child protection in these settings. I mean, the whole thing is absurd. I showed Tom the results of our FOI request. Could the lack of a clear legal requirement explain the vastly different reporting rates to the local authorities? It doesn't add up. Um, it could be lack of referrals. It could be schools just saying, no, 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 we'll just, we'll deal with this. We'll deal with this in-house. Of course, all schools are expected to have sufficient safeguarding arrangements to prevent abuse in the first place. These are checked in regular inspections. We've looked at the most recent inspection report for every boarding school in England. Depending on the rating system used by each different inspectorate, when it came to safeguarding, one in 10 schools either failed to meet national standards or else didn't meet the requirements needed to be given a rating of good. So what is the industry today doing to protect children? Are cases being referred to the authorities? And why have so few schools publicly apologized to survivors? Today I'm meeting with the Boarding Schools Association which represents 90% of boarding schools. Can you, hand on your heart, say that the grotesque failures and abuses that we saw, really not very long ago, are impossible today? What I can say is that everyone who works in boarding today is professional, caring, and doing everything they can to make safeguarding their number one priority. There's no doubt um, that, a, that there was a period where some people at some schools experienced some appalling abuse, and it's absolutely shocking. But in my experience, there isn't, there isn't any school out there which you know, doesn't want to listen to victims and, where it can, as quickly as possible, say sorry. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, th there seems to be a, another colder-hearted um, consideration coming in, which is that schools don't want to apologise for fear of having to pay compensation. I don't know individual cases with individual schools and you're obviously in touch with survivors who are telling you a different thing. Um, uh, compensation arrangements would be a matter between a particular survivor and a particular school and, and we couldn't comment on that. Last year, the BSA finally issued rules telling its members they must report any allegations of abuse, but say it's time for the government to make that law. It's the only system which can probably work because why would you not have a, a, a system where people are required to report abuse? It's, um, so remove any doubt, remove any ambiguity, and let's have mandatory reporting. And that ultimately contribute, contributes to making children safer. Other leading organizations like the NSPCC, IAPS, and the Independent Schools Council have told us they too support mandatory reporting for boarding schools. We asked the government about this. They declined an interview. 
but said that in 2016 they held a public consultation about whether it should be introduced and they will publish its finding in due course. But how long can we wait while abuse and grooming still goes on in schools? I've been contacted by Matthew, who only left school this decade. As a teenager, he boarded at one of Britain's most prestigious institutions and was sexually assaulted by a teaching assistant away from school premises. I went back to school the next term and I told him that I didn't want him to contact me. And like a boomerang, he came back into my life. He told me that if I told anyone about this case, then they would just say that I was gay to everyone in the school. And he just got increasingly controlling over being in aspects of my life. And what kind of things was he doing? So he was taking me out to restaurants. He got to know my friends through kind of social media. I had over 120 mutual friends with him on Facebook by the time I'd left the school. There were instances when he got me to go back to his, like, flat, and I was just there by myself. So he would in invite you back to his room at the school. I mean, was that normal for teachers at the school? Could they do that to, to children? Not on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The rules were, for some reason, didn't seem to apply to him. How obvious was his behavior? Retrospectively, it seems really obvious. His abuser's behavior clearly broke the school's own safeguarding policies, but his actions seem to have gone unnoticed. They even promoted the man to become a teacher. Did you ever think of telling anyone at the school? There genuinely was not anyone who was suitable at the school for me to tell. First of all, I wasn't really sure about the procedure that would be involved. I didn't know whether I would have to be to leave the school. I didn't know whether teachers would believe me. Matthew went to the police a couple of years after he left the school. His abuser has been jailed. Do you blame the school for what happened? In terms of the incident of sexual assault, I don't blame the school. But in terms of the grooming, the school was complicit. Matthew's school was inspected six months after his teacher was arrested. It was given a rating of excellent for safeguarding, so parents of pupils would have no way of knowing there had been allegations of a breach at the school. People say that these kind of things could never happen in a school today. Do you agree with that? People are very happy to pat themselves on the back when this is labelled as historic or it wasn't under this leadership at the school and things have changed. And I think that that mentality diverts the attention away from thinking dynamically about how abuse can exist in the 21st century. It's been four years since I first wrote about my time at Ashton House. Today, I was meant to meet with its owners to hear how things have changed. In the end, they decided against the interview, but said I could still visit my old school. Coming back to Ashton doesn't feel good. I spent five of the formative, most miserable years of my life here, and it's, it's somewhere that still appears in nightmares. My school, like so many others, has never formally apologized for what happened to us under their care. Keen to distance themselves from these abuses of the past. Perhaps that is part of the problem. Because if we never truly acknowledge our mistakes, how can we learn from them? Since I first wrote about the abuse at this school and many others, I've heard so many stories of misery, of, of real horror. And it was chiefly because they didn't listen to me, to my friends, to all those school children then. And I really hope now that this story is historical, that children are being listened to today. Because if they're not, then these same crimes can be committed with impunity. We have to listen to children, it's the only answer. And if you've been affected by the issues raised in this programme, you can visit itv.com slash advice for support information.